Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for more people to join, and then we'll start our webinar uh, shortly. Also, a disclaimer, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will post it later uh, on our YouTube channel. Okay, should we start now? Okay. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in uh, our webinar series with Medical Physics for World Benefit. Uh, today's um, topic is on radionuclei dosimetry and rise of teranostics. Our speaker today is from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Dr. John Hum, who would present to us in 45 minutes, followed by uh, five minutes of questions and answers, and then final comments. Um, there will be MCQs sent to your emails, and uh, please answer them. And upon answering them, you would receive an attending certificate. Uh, as I said, this webinar is recorded. Uh, it will be posted online on our YouTube and shared by the community. Dr. Hum is an attending physicist and chief of the molecular and x-ray emitting physics services at the Department of Medical Physics and Radiology of MSK in New York City. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat uh, box. And uh, without any further ado, Please, I will give the mic and the screen to Dr. Ham to start. Thank you and welcome. Okay, let me share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Let me bring up my uh, presentation. Can everybody uh, can everybody see my presentation? We can see it. All right. Well, first, I'd like to thank the Medical Physics for World Benefit Organization for inviting me to speak with you today. Uh, the topic of my talk will be radionuclide dosimetry and the rise of theragnostics, uh, in which I'll attempt to go from the early history of theragnostics to the current major theragnostic agents in use today. So here is the contents of my talk today. First, I'm just going to go over some of the different classes of theragnostic molecules, then talk about the earliest theragnostic, which is radioiodine therapy for thyroid cancer to talk about treatment personalization and introduce the concept of maximum tolerated activity, uh, talk about planar and tomographic based dosimetry, compare radio labeled antibodies versus peptides, and then uh, talk about the lutetium theragnostic peptides that are in current uh, mainstream use. These are lutetium dodatate and lutetium PSMA 617 talk a bit about the different radionuclide dosimetry software that's out there, and then uh, conclude with some considerations for setting up a theragnostic program. So there's a whole gamut of uh, different molecular weight theragnostic agents. 
uh, that you can see listed here. The simplest are those which are just radioactive elements, such as radioiodine for the management of thyroid cancer, that's just simply 131 Daltons in size, radium chloride, or Zofigo as it's uh, uh, no, known, for the treatment of castrate-resistant prostate cancer, metastatic to bone. Then there are the small peptides, which are small sequences of amino acids with specificity for an expressed tumor cell surface marker, such as somatostatin or prostate-specific membrane antigen. Then there are antibodies, which are large molecular weight proteins that today, through molecular imaging, not molecular imaging, molecular engineering can be made to target practically any identified uh, receptor. Intact IgG antibodies are typically about 150 kilodaltons, but several smaller molecular weight antibody engineered fragments have been explored for applications in targeted radionuclide therapies. And then there's nanoparticles. These are the molecular aircraft carriers that can be biologic, such as liposomes, or completely synthetic, such as carbon nanotubes that can be made to any size with practically any cargo from drugs to fluorescent agents to radioactivity. Two nanoparticles in widespread use in radionuclide therapy today include the Y90 glass therospheres and the biodegradable Y90 resin serospheres. The first radioiodine, well, let me go here. It may surprise you actually to learn that the very first theragnostic therapies were performed well before the first cobalt isotope or LINAP-based radiotherapy treatments. Saul Hertz, who's shown here, the gentleman on the right, uh, discovered that radioactive iodine concentrates in the thyroid gland and conceived of the idea to treat benign and malignant uh, diseases of the thyroid using radioactive iodine. Now, radium isotopes have been directly applied to treat skin cancers with positive effect even during Marie Curie's lifetime. But what differentiates Dr. Hertz's contribution was that radioactive iodine was administered systemically as a drink, employing the natural targeting properties of iodine to the thyroid gland. And secondly, he made an attempt to measure the amount of radioactive iodine uptake in the thyroid. So the first radioiodine treatment for a patient with Graves' disease, this wasn't the first patient, but one of the first patients in the picture here, was performed at Mass General Hospital in Boston on the 31st of March, 1941. The Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging honors this contribution to medicine through the Saul Hertz Award that each year honors an individual who makes an outstanding contribution to radionuclide therapy. And who knows, that person might be one of you on this webinar in the future. Leonardis Marinelli shown in the photo at the top of the slide here, was a medical physicist born in Buenos Aires of Italian parents. He joined the Department of Medical Physics at Memorial Sloan Kettering under Fahler in the early 1940s. And he is credited with the first theoretical foundation of dosimetry from administered radionuclides. This formula, called the Marinelli dose formula, provides a relationship between the iodine 131 activity that a nuclear medicine physician needs to give to deliver an intended radiation absorbed dose to the thyroid. The 25 is a unit's conversion factor. Small m, the thyroid mass in grams, as determined in those days by ultrasound. IU 24 hours is the percent radioactive iodine uptake in the thyroid at 24 hours. And T effect is the effective half-life in days of radioiodine in the thyroid. But how do you get these last two terms? By giving a small amount of radioactive iodine and measuring the neck uptake at 24 hours and at subsequent time points to determine the effective clearance rate using a thyroid probe. Thyroid probes are just a simple sodium, sodium iodide detector that just simply counts photons. So you can determine how much is taken up in the neck by measuring the neck and comparing it to a standard and by simple ratioing. The basis of patient-specific radionuclide therapies of cancer is the following. There are two things that we really need to know. First, how much activity can we give the patient? 
And this, of course, is determined by the toxicity to the dose-limiting organ. The most radiosensitive organ in the body is in almost all cases for radionuclide therapies, the bone marrow. But there are other dose-limiting organs to, to consider too, and these would be kidney, salivary glands, lung, and possibly others, depending on the targeting agent used. Secondly, how much radiation dose can we deliver to the tumor? And this, of course, is first and foremost limited by the activity we can give the patient, but it's determined also by the pharmacokinetics of the tumor uptake and retention. The principal dose-limiting toxicity for practically all systemic therapies is bone marrow. How much radiation dose can the bone marrow safely receive before the onset of marrow toxicity, and how can we measure it? After World War II, scientists were very interested in knowing what was the lethal dose 50, the LD50, for total body irradiation because, of course, of the risk of nuclear war. And based upon the limited data that they had uh, from the atomic bomb survivors, they estimated that the LD50 was about 4.5 gray, and that's a number that we typically use today. This means that if, the, if, a, if a group of the population receives a dose of 4.5 gray to the total body, 50% of those people will die of bone marrow toxicity. But at doses less than two gray, there appeared to be negligible marrow toxicity. This data has been substantiated in a landmark paper, the first on personalized dosimetry by Richard Benoit, who was the head of nuclear medicine, and published this article in 1962. Uh, and they actually confirmed this by actually giving high dose I131 uh, uh, radioiodine therapy to their thyroid cancer patients. But if bone marrow is dose limiting for thyroid therapies, how can we estimate the dose to the bone marrow? We need to somehow determine what's the maximum activity of I131 we can give a patient to ensure that the radiation dose to the marrow does not exceed two gray. Benoit and his team at NFSK had a very clever idea. Bone marrow is distributed in a complex configuration throughout the body. It's, part, it's inside of the skeletal bones. But the bone marrow is very, very well vascularized as shown in this schematic diagram here. Also, the capillary vasculature in the marrow is fenestrated. And that means it's extremely leaky. This led Benoit to believe that it's reasonable to assume that radioiodine contents and blood and marrow and, are in equilibrium. And therefore, measuring dose to blood would be a good surrogate for dose to the marrow. Therefore, if we give a tracer activity of radioiodine, we can determine the pharmacokinetics of activity from blood samples. And from this, we can determine the self-dose to the blood from the non-penetrating beta particles that are emitted from I131. That's about two thirds of the actual energy released from an I131 decay. And this we can assume to be locally deposited, and that's the D beta term. But iodine 131 emits several gamma rays that deposit their energy over large distances not locally. Therefore, activity within any organ in the body will contribute radiation dose to the blood and, and to the marrow. So to account for these, we need to measure the whole body activity and the clearance from the whole body. If we get this term, d, d gamma, and add it to d beta, then we'll have the total dose. And from that, we can determine what the maximum tolerated activity is. So now let me talk you through the general methodology that we still use to measure maximum tolerated activity for an individual patient at MSK who receives radioiodine therapy for thyroid cancer. First, we administer a tracer dose or a tracer amount, I should say, of radioiodine. Then we take blood samples at multiple time points post-administration of the radioiodine tracer. Then we take multiple total body images. Now, in the early days, this methodology was developed prior to there being gamma cameras. So they used to use a total body uh, uh, counter that actually Marinelli himself built. But today we just do total body sweeps. And at the time when the patient comes back to have these total body images, we take the blood samples to for the convenience of the patient. Then we plot both blood activity as a function of time and total body counts as a function of time. 
These curves, when integrated, uh, determine the area under the blood curve and the total body activity curve. And this tells us the total number of I131 decays in blood and in the body that allows us to calculate the radiation dose contribution from non-penetrating beta particles and penetrating gamma rays. Note, the radiation dose consists of two terms, a biological uptake and clearance term in orange, that's this integral of A over MDT, and a physics term, that is the properties of the radiation energy emitted, that show, that's it, this is in blue, this is the sum of the emissions, delta, and the fraction of those that are locally deposited. Usually the beta, that, uh, that phi term is one, but it will be small for gamma rays. The total dose to the marrow is then simply, as I said earlier, the, the contribution from the beta as determined from counting the blood and from the whole body, that's the gamma ray dose contribution. And once you know the dose per unit activity, the grays per megabecker, well, then simply rearranging the equation gives you the maximum activity that you can give to a patient so as not to exceed two gray to the bone marrow. Once the maximum toroid activity is known, we can then focus on the radiation dose, absorbed dose to the tumor or what tumors might receive. For targeting agents such as radioiodine and patients with high lesion uptake, as in this case, region of interest analysis can be performed on planar scans to estimate the tumor dose. A calibration standard of known I131 activity is known to convert, is used to convert counts in the image to activity. But in cases where the lesion to background are not high, tomographic imaging is necessary. Quantitative SPECT allows tomographic images to be acquired in which voxel units provide activity per cc rather than just relative counts. Although I131 SPECT images, especially those with poor count density, can be of very low quality, as I'm sure many of you know. So over the past few years, we've actually used I124, which is a PET imaging isotope, which has an unusually long 4.2 day half-life so that we can do serial images by PET. PET provides quantitative images of much higher spatial resolution, as you can see here, and it allows us to determine the uptake and clearance of individual lesions. So that means by integration of the area under each of these curves, we can get individual lesions. Here's a lesion that's actually in the lung, and here's a lesion that's in the neck. And it's interesting when you look at the characteristics of uptake and clearance, notice here this one in the lung starts off very high, but then with time becomes rapidly, the, the uptake is rapidly clear from this lesion where there are others in the neck where there's slow accumulation, which is indicated by this orange line here. So they the pharmacokinetics, if you like, of lesion uptake, even within the same patient can be very variable from lesion to lesion. So now let's jump from the past into the present. I think I've shown you that theranostics is not new, but prevalence was in the realm of research trials with only a very few exceptions. Uh, that was radioiodine of which we've spoken up until now, MIBG, which I'm not gonna speak about today, but that was that's still being used for the treatment of pediatric patients with neuroblastoma. There were a couple of antibodies that were approved I131 Bexa and Y90 Zevelin for the treatment of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. But all this really changed with the emergence of tumor targeting peptides for neuroendocrine and prostate cancers. Highly specific tumor targeting antibodies have been around for more than 40 years. But except in the lymphoma space, they remain primarily confined to research trials, whereas there are a much smaller number of tumor-targeting peptides available. But yet these have emerged as the theragnostics of choice, at least for the moment. So why is this? In this slide, I show a series of a serial PET scans from a PSMA-targeting antibody. This PET image was acquired with a long three plus day positron emitting zirconium 89 label PSMA. 
so you can image for several days post-administration. I'm going to actually highlight three disease sites. One here, the second one here in the marrow, and the third. And what you notice is, is that the, the actual uptake in these lesions is overshadowed in most part by the normal physiologic distribution of the antibody. You don't really see some of these lesions on the one and 24 hour images, and sometimes not even on the 72 hour image either. And that's because antibodies have a very large molecular weight, meaning that their half-life in blood could be two to three days. And this property is neither particularly good for imaging nor for therapy. Now let's compare that to a different patient now, one that had received an FDA approved PSMA targeting peptide, in this case, PYL. Tumor targeting is visible. Look at the time scale here of, these, of this sequence of them. It's very different from the antibody. And what you notice is, is that tumor targeting is visible in under one hour in these images. And that's and that there's actually rapid clearance from the blood pool and from the rest of the body, allowing the contrast to be much more visual, much more of visible much earlier. So this means that lesions can actually be imaged using a short-lived F18 or a gallium 68 pet tracer. If we imagine if we had used F18 on the antibody in the study above, then all you would have seen would have been the blood pool activity. So when you're dealing with antibodies, you have to label the uh, antibodies with much longer lived positron emitting isotopes. So there are two radio labeled peptides that are in current widespread use and have been approved in North America, Europe, Australia, and potentially other parts of the world possibly too. These are the somatostatin targeting agent and prostate specific membrane antigen, PSMA. Somatostatin is highly upregulated in neuroendocrine tumors. Neuroendocrine tumors are unusual tumors that possess traits to those of nerve cells and hormone producing cells. They most commonly emanate in the GI tract and the gastrointestinal system and are referred to commonly as carcinoids, but also include a subset of hormone producing pancreatic islet tumor cells as well as a variety of other rare tumors such as Merkel cell carcinoma. For a patient to be eligible to receive lutetium dodatate therapy, you have to have evidence that the patient's tumor expresses somatostatin. And to demonstrate that, that's done using uh, gallium 68 dodatate. So gallium 68 is a 68 minute half-life PET tracer. So the dose contribution from this imaging agent is very small. It's interesting to note that the approval to receive Ludothera, when approved in the USA by, by uh, the FDA, was approved without any necessity to perform further imaging during the therapy. So once the base has been approved, they go on, they receive therapy, and the approval is for up to four treatments of 200 millicuries or 7.4 gigabecros, separated by eight week intervals to allow sufficient time for bone, uh, for blood count recovery. The PSMA targeting peptide called Plavicto is a similar story. A gallium 68 PSMA agent, PSMA 11, is required for the patient to be eligible for treatment. In other words, to provide proof of PSMA expressing metastatic prostate cancer, we need to get these images, document uh, uh, tumor targeting. Then treatment consists of up to six treatments with 200 millicuries, 7.4 gigabecros of of uh, the uh, PSMA, uh, Plavicto is the actual commercial name for it, uh, but it's PSMA 617. Uh, and the, here the uh, separation between doses of the six treatment can be as short as six weeks. Again, notice that the clinical protocols consist of fixed dosing regimens, regardless of the patient disease burden. Can you imagine a patient might have one lesion, two lesions, 100 lesions, 100 metastatic. It's a one size fits all for both of these treatment agents. This lack of personalization is really interesting, isn't it? Particularly because the therapeutic radionuclide, lutetium-177, is a beta emitter that has a small yield, 16% of imageable photons of energies 113 and 208 kV, making it the perfect theragnostic radionuclide. 
you can truly see what you treat and performing patient scans will not result in a large exposure to the nuclear medicine staff taking care of the patient because it's only a fraction. It's unlike I-131, it's only a fraction of the energy is, uh, is emitted in the form of gamma rays. One question you might ask is, is there concordance between gallium and lutetium? If you're using gallium to uh, determine whether a patient is eligible for the treatment, and here I show a particular example, where on the left you see the gallium PET, go to take PET scan, and then these are total body sweeps. As I mentioned to you earlier, there's no requirement to perform uh, uh, gamma camera imaging, but we typically do a memorial post-treatment as a QA scan to verify um, verify uh, 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 correct uptake. But you notice that there's pretty good concordance. So one is a pretty good surrogate of the other. Now, let me walk you through a typical uh, um, Ludothera case, a lutetium dodotate case. First, the patient receives the gallium uh, dodotate PET scan. And if the patient shows evidence of disease, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and that's decided by the, but usually by the nuclear medicine physician and the treating medical oncologist. If positive disease is observed, the patient qualifies for treatment. Now, in addition to bone marrow being dose limiting for these peptide therapies, there's also con some concern of renal toxicity, because as you see here, there's very large and rapid uptake and clearance of these peptides because they're small molecular weight molecules. They get cleared uh, uh, through the kidneys. So to lessen, to try to reduce, or in efforts to try to reduce the kidney dose and mitigate any renal toxicity, an amino acid solution is administered for 30 minutes, which is really a, a mixture of lysine and arginine in an attempt to accelerate the clearance of, this, of these therognestic peptides from the kidney. After that, lutetium uh, dodotate is infused over 30 minutes by a Gracebury syringe pump. Now, as I said, whereas usually imaging, post-therapy imaging is not required, for these therognostics at MSK, we always perform a whole body scan after every treatment alongside a calibration standard to identify any maldistributions, infiltrations, et cetera. So it's a Q QA scan to verify that the treatment was successfully administered. So what is the potential of theragnostics and, tar and targeted radiopharmaceutics, pharmaceuticals? Well, first you see what you treat. You can quantify the radiation uh, delivered to the target volume and to the dose limiting tissues. What an incredible advance over chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, you just give a one size fits all treatment and you don't know anything about where it goes, right? Yet it may come as some surprise when I say no one is, well, very few people are doing personalized dosimetry driven treatments. So theragnostics currently follows a chemotherapy model. And that's because the field today is being driven by the pharmaceutical industry who get paid for each dose given and not for optimizing a patient specific dose. And that's a big difference between these forms of therapies and external beam radiotherapy, where every treatment beam is very highly customized to that particular patient's tumor. So I think there's two reasons for this. The first, is, is that we still do not, we still have not done the appropriate trials to demonstrate a dose response for radionuclide therapy. So this raises doubts with physicians and industry as to whether dosimetry is really worthwhile. And secondly, until recently, we really lack the necessary computer tools to estimate the radiation dose to tumor and dose limiting organs to solve the uh, uh, Item one above. Dosimetry used to be, or well, used to be both extremely challenging and time consuming, but I think now times are changing. So let's get down to now and start to talk about uh, radionuclide dosimetry and the methods that we can do this in a very expeditious way for patients who undergo theragnostics. The Medical Internal Radiation Dose Committee, MERD, has several publications, and I encourage you to read them. Uh, the, one of the latest is this primer on the right, that describe how to determine the radiation absorbed dose to organs and tumors from internally administered radiopharmaceuticals. 
And the fundamental equation to determine dose to any target region or organ, let's just pick one, the lung, the dose to the lung is really the sum of the activity in all of the source organs, that is organs where you visualize from your imaging, uh, uh, your, radio, your theragnostic, where there's uptake that's visible and quantifiable. And it consists of summing the dose contribution from the activity within each source organ to the target, to each target organ. So for example, the dose to the lungs will be the summation of the cumulative activity of all the radioactive decays from the lung itself. This is referred to as the self dose, plus the contribution from radioactive emissions within all organs with identifiable activity. So the lung, it gets beta dose and so from activity in the lung, but it's also receiving contribution from the gamma rays that are emitted from activity in the liver, the spleen, the kidney, and all the other organs. So to do dosimetry, there are two basic divisions. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, harmonious, but you can do organ-based dosimetry or you can do voxel-based, voxel-level dosimetry. The first is organ-level dosimetry. And the first program actually was Olinda, which is still out there, was, and can be bought. It was written by Mike Staben. And that, that's commercially available through the company Hermes. What is shown here is a similar organ-based dosimetry. Well, I'm going to show that in a minute, actually. So the what, what I sorry, I've just uh, uh, I wanted to say something else. Let me just let me just reframe my thoughts. So at organ level dosimetry, we, we we quantify the activity with each organ using serial gamma camera images, and determine the organ residence time, and the absorbed dose to each organ is then determined by summing the contribution of the activity of all organs in the body using pre-calculated S-factors for standard organ dimensions. There are several different digital phantoms that represent males, this is females here, that go from babies through to infants to adults, and now there are even obese patients and so on. This, uh, this database of, of digital phantoms is growing and so therefore, when determining the dose from organ distributions, you can do this by actually picking a phantom, a digital phantom that is closest to the actual patient based on weight, sex, age, and so on, size. In voxel level dosimetry, there are uh, computer programs that use the voxel intensities from the patient images as the source terms and calculate the dose to every target voxel from every source voxel, either by a convolution with a point, uh, a dose point kernel or by Monte Carlo techniques. So here is an example of uh, a software program that was developed by Adam Kessner here at Memorial and Wes Bolsch at the University of Flo uh, Florida with significant contributions from the postdoctoral fellows at both those institutions. And the software is, uh, built on Excel and was funded by a U01NH grant uh, uh, that's down here. Now, I know this slide is extremely busy and it might be hard for many of you to read it, but what in brief, everything is on a single screen. And what you do is you just enter the radionuclide up here, whatever it is, the TCM177, for example, but all the different radionuclides are here. You then enter the sex and size of the patient from which it can actually pick one of those digital phantoms that most closely represents your patient. Then you enter for all, for all organs where there's actually a visible uptake. You determine the residence times of your theragnostic in each of those organs. If there's information as to the uncertainty, say you have a population uh, of different patients, you can actually put in the standard deviation of, uh, of the clearance from, from uh, from a, a, a cohort of patients. Then on the fly, the, the actual program determines the dose mill, in milligray per megabecquerel administered down here for adipose tissue, adrenals, bone, breast, and so on and so forth, colon, esophagus. And the best part of this software, which I think you're really gonna like is, the, how much does it cost? It's free. You can download it from the MERDSoft webpage that is given right here, right at that location there. Okay. What did I do? All right, let's go and do something. Okay. So then 
there are uh, a number of companies that have been developing uh, 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 voxel-based dosimetry, radionuclide dosimetry methods. And I'm just going to show you, for the interests of time, I'm just going to show you one example, which is MIM, that we have. It's not the only one we have in-house, but MIM Shore Plan MRT. So this, uh, these software packages, they really do resemble, don't they, uh, radiation therapy treatment planning software platforms. And some even have the potential to integrate theragnostic dosimetry with radiotherapy plans. In the early days of radionuclide dosimetry, the most time consuming step was to contour the organs and structures of interest. This could be a day or more to do that. But nowadays, AI, artificial intelligence, is becoming increasingly more advanced and auto segmentation is really becoming a reality. Here you see the organ contouring on the CT component on the, the top here of a spec CT acquisition. And that those contours are then transferred to the bottom. Here's the fusion scan showing you the overlay of the spect with the CT. So this is the, as I said, this is the MIM Shore Planet MRT contouring. So there are, uh, MIM has the, has the ability to actually segment automatically several of the organs and others that it does not. You have to do that manually as with, as with the tumors. MIM also has a, a kind of unique registration capability. They, rather than just registering the entire body or the entire image series, it actually, once the organs are segmented, it does an organ by organ registration, which overcomes some of the challenges associated with the patient not being positioned exactly the same in each of the imaging sessions. But here you see, once that image registration has been done, then it can actually determine the time activity curves and then integrate those curves using uh, a selection of different single exponential or series of different mathematical functions to determine the cumulative activity or the number of decays or the residence time within each of the organs. And here's an example here, having done that for the kidney, the lung, the parotid, et cetera. And here's an example of the typical dosimetry output displays as you can see, they really resemble those of an external beam treatment planning system, don't they? You see at the top, it shows the axial, sagittal, and coronal CT cuts in the top row. And then at the bottom, you see the color wash and isodose contours corresponding to the CT in the top row. Then on the right, you can also generate uh, uh, with this uh, uh, software, generate some dose volume histograms for each of the organs and for any lesions or for any contoured structure in the uh, in, in the image series. So there are numerous different commercial software platforms available on the market today. These happen to be the ones we have on our server running at MSK, MIM Shore Plan MRT, which I just showed you examples, Hermes Alinda, which is organ-based, uh, and also Hermes has a voxel dosimetry software tool, Varian Velocity, and also Voximetry Torch. And then there's also, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, free radionuclide dosimetry software tools. These tend to be the organ-based. There's the NAH uh, uh, software that is available, and here's the link to that. And then there's Adam Kester's, of which I showed you the screen earlier, uh, www.merdsoft.org. And one thing actually I forgot to mention, which is unique with actually Adam Wes's um, uh, 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 software, uh, MERD doses, is that they actually include also the dose from the CT contributions, which is important if you're looking at just diagnostic studies, uh, because most scanners today are spec CT or PET CT. You don't typically have spec alone or PET alone. So that allows you to add the dose contribution from the CT to that of the radionuclide. Now, of course, this is not an exclusive list. There's enormous, uh, there's, there's a large number of other companies that provide software, and that number is actually growing every year. So I wanted to uh, uh, conclude my talk by briefly touching upon what issues need to be taken into consideration when uh, setting up a theragnostic clinic. I fully recognize that radio radioactive materials licenses and regulations will vary significantly from country to country. But the question you need to ask when embarking on a theragnostic program, the questions you need to ask are the following. Does the center have appropriate 
radioactive materials license to handle the activities of the rel of the relevant radionuclides that you're going to be using, such as I-131, I-1, uh, lutetium-177, at the activities that you intend to order. Are there appropriate radioactive waste storage facilities in your center? Are there appropriate trained and authorized users to administer theragnostics? Are there, appropriate, are there appropriate treatment rooms with adequate shielding for these patients? Is there sufficient staff education and badging of all personnel that are interacting with the patients? And do you have appropriate documented release criteria and printed instructions for the family whom will be taking care of these patients? There's no field that's more diverse than this field of theragnostics. And so for theragnostic programs to run successfully, it really requires a multidisciplinary effort and coordination of several individuals, medical oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians, radiation oncologists, radiation safety health care professionals, medical physicists with nuclear medicine training, nurses, and a clinical care team. I got this slide. I wanted to thank Rachel Bartlett, who gave me, I thought this was really a nice slide. So in summary and conclusion, radionuclide therapies, I think I've shown you, are not new. Radioiodine therapy of thyroid cancer uh, began in the 1940s, but has been reborn due to the efficacy of these new theragnostic somatostatin and PSA, PSMA targeting peptides. Currently, most radionuclide therapies are done with fixed activities with no personalization. Can you believe it? And that's because personalization requires dosimetry. Tools to conduct organ and voxelized dosimetry, though, are now becoming widely available. Theragnostics requires multidisciplinary coordination and cooperation, but I believe this field to be a major advance in radiation medicine, and therefore the effort is really well worth it. Whereas the current focus is on somatostatin and PSMA targeting peptides, big pharma, the big pharmaceutical companies are heavily invested in the discovery of new theragnostic agents with beta and also with alpha emitters. So I anticipate a really exciting future for the field. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to my uh, webinar and uh, anyone who wants to ask any questions, uh, please do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Hum. Uh, this was really good. Um, we have a couple of questions um, for people. If you still have any more questions, please keep typing them in the chat or on the question and answer, uh, and we'll uh, ask. Uh, one of the questions asked was, how do you find the mass of the thyroid gland in the activity formula? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, at the time when this, when Marinelli made this, uh, when he made his, his seminal paper, Back in those days, they used ultrasound. And so you can often get it from ultrasound. Today, many of these patients, of course, have a CT. So you can get a measurement from a CT. But back in those days, CTs in the 1940s weren't yet, uh, CT had not been yet discovered, right? And that was, uh, or invented, I should say, not discovered, invented, yeah. So uh, I know people asking about the slides and recording. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and posted on our, MPWB uh, YouTube page. So right. please uh, watch out for that information. Um, right, right. Another question that we have is, is there an alternative non-invasive way of finding out dose per activity rather than collecting blood at a, at a different time points and estimating? Yes, well, as I said, actually you could, you could actually avoid taking blood if you had really good, it depends on actually the, 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 the radionuclide therapy. Uh, we don't take bloods, for example, on uh, the theragnostics, such as Ludothera or Plavicto. So blood is not necessary there. The pharmacokinetics of those tracers were well established. And with peptides, as I, the, the images indicate, uh, leave the blood pool very, very rapidly. So usually marrow toxicity, you can give higher doses. If you wanted to go to the limit and give more than 200 millicuries and I think uh, certain elite institutions are starting to uh, uh, experiment with not giving the standard one size fits all. Uh, then I think you would need to monitor blood, maybe not so much to determine the activity, but to measure blood counts as a factor to look at any complications to resulting from irradiation to the marrow. But those images, we also, when you give higher and higher doses, 
for the theragnostics, which are the mainstream now, you have to also be careful with kidney dose. I mentioned that. And also the salivary glands. Some patients at very high doses are receiving salivary gland toxicity. Not a large fraction, but certainly those that give, for example, in PSMA, the full six treatments uh, sometimes experience salivary glands. And so that has been an issue. Is this billable using uh, radon codes, uh, radon codes? Yeah, yes, uh, we're actually at Memorial not yet billing, but I'm aware of several centers that have started in the U.S. to bill. I don't know how this is in other countries. In other countries, of course, it may be very, very different. Uh, so I suspect maybe in Europe and in Australia, uh, who actually began many of these theragnostic treatments prior to we doing that in the United States, or getting approval to, to perform these as standard of care, prior to in the United States. So the answer is, is yes, there is for doing uh, for doing a dose plan. Uh, and in that way, it may be it may be possible to make the cost. If you buy some of the uh, software platforms like MIM or any of these others uh, platforms, they tend to be rather expensive. You know, uh, uh, I don't want to tell you the amount, but it's greater than twenty thousand dollars per license. So it's quite it's quite expensive, but if if you get a thousand dollars back per patient, then if you did, if you had the volume and you were doing more than 20, 30 patients a year, and all indications with the rise of this uh, of this uh, 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 of these radio pharmaceuticals is we are going to many institutions, and the reason why there is such a rise, and I didn't say this, was because the therapeutic benefits in patients that. Uh, let's take prostate uh, cancer patients. When they have a primary, they either get the pro they either they undergo hormonal therapy and then they may undergo surgery and the prostate gland is removed, or they may get radiation therapy. But as soon as they metastasize, then of course they have to go to to further treatments. And when they no longer respond to hormonal therapy, they become hormone refractory. Then uh, there is a niche for uh, targeted radionuclides in patients where there is PSMA expression. Okay. Um, there are two similar questions. I'll just join the two. Uh, what do you estimate the main barriers for these therapies and dosimetry to be in low middle income countries? Um, yes, and, you yes. Know, yeah. Well, it, it, it's, that's a really great question. Thanks for that one. Uh, even in the United States, uh, there, there is uh, many of the pharmaceutical companies and uh, many physicians in our own field question the value of performing dosimetry. In external beam radiotherapy, you know very accurately the dose that you deliver to the tumor. You know it within a couple of percent. But with, with actually theragnostic agents, you know, you have to bring the patient and get many, many images. And the uncertainty of quantification, I would say, I'm just going to throw it out. There's about 10, 10 to 20%. That's how accurate you can get uh, tumor doses. Then there are factors which do not, there are, there are the distribution in larger lesions may not be homogeneous. There may be heterogeneity of distribution within the tumor, which results, which makes it complicated. We saw dose volume histograms can be generated, but the ranges of these beta particles are a couple of millimeters below the resolution of SPECT uh, gamma camera imaging systems. So therefore to relate dose from these voxelized dosimetry to response is much more challenging. And so that has led to some skepticism, but I'm a person who truly believes that if you're gonna make an advance, you have to start somewhere. And uh, the reason why dosimetry is not being performed, in other words, you don't even have to perform imaging. You only have to perform the PET image, which is the eligibility, determine eligibility. Uh, and so I think there will be there will be two parallel lines. There will be many groups and private clinics that just treat the patient. And then there will be other places that will decide, let's see if we can give more optimal patients and follow the model of external beam radiotherapy planning. And uh, I think um, it's going to be challenging, of course. And, uh, you know, regarding resources in in, uh, in several countries of the world, you know, it's very challenging to do multiple uh, imaging sessions when you have a limit in the terms of the amount of PET or uh, uh, SPECT imaging devices that you may have. Uh, another question we have here is, uh, 
I'm curious, what role do you think OJ electrons emitting radionuclides might play in the future of terranostics? <laughs> That's now I, a disclosure here. I did my PhD thesis on OJ electron emitters. Nice. So that was now that was over 40 years ago, just to let you know. But I think that the difficulty, I'm a big believer in OJs because I did my thesis in them. But there's one problem with OJ electron emitters, and that is you've got to get the source to every single tumor cell. And that is going to be challenging. One of the advantages, actually, of betas and even alphas, but to a lesser degree, is, is you don't have to get your agent bound to every single cell. Right. So that's uh, with, 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 with a chemotherapy agent, it's got to get you've got to get up in every cell. And I think uh, one of the interesting things with these serognostic agents is imagine PSMA is not expressed on every single cell or somatostatin. Then by targeting cells in the neighborhood, you'll get crossfire to cells that are either not reached because of diffusion, because of diffusion limits or because of uh, uh, the, the receptor expression. So with OJs, you've got to get it. You're back to the kind of chemo model. You've got to get it not only on every cell. You probably have to get it internalized into the cell and in close proximity to the target for radiobiological cell death, which is the DNA. So that's going to be challenging, but I wouldn't give up because I think there is there is a, a some great interest. Let me say this: there could be a role if combined with others, and people are thinking about this, for example, with beta and alpha, combining the two together in a single treatment. The barrier to that, of course, is expense. You know, it's these radiopharmaceuticals are phenomenally expensive, and now you're going to combine two together. You know, that's what's going to be challenging. Just the the, the economics are are not there yet. Uh, do you, how do you handle cases where the cancer is recurred? Like, do you can we do retreatments? Uh... Yes. Well, in external beam, as you know, you do bring them back and you do retreat them. Uh, here, it's very challenging because um, unless if you usually the reason if the patient is refractory is is because of the disappearance of the targeting receptor. So that would be the case, for example, in thyroid cancer, you treat. And then eventually the amount of iodine with subsequent treatments goes down, the disease becomes more anaplastic. People are looking at methods of, of uh, uh, redifferentiating. There is a series of drugs now that try to uh, uh, improve uh, radioiodine uptake, even in cells where there's very low or, or negligible uptake. Uh, with PSMA, of course, what happens is, you know, you do get after several treatments, you can get uh, always uh, patients who have multiple metastases don't necessarily have all of the metastases expressed in PSMA, but after multiple treatments, it becomes more challenging. But that doesn't mean to say that you can't combine, um, and we're certainly looking into doing that, combine a theragnostic such as PSMA for targeting those that are high expressing PSMA with external beam radiotherapy for those cases where there's low uptake. So, but combination theragnostics are going to be challenging unless if you have uh, agents that bind to complementary receptors on the cell. In other words, you know, cells that don't express high PSMA may express some other antigen that uh, that you can treat with another theragnostic that targets that pathway. Uh, some really good questions coming, but uh, one question is: Are you aware of any uh, APM task group report or an MPPG for? That proposes guidelines on how to start a radio pharmaceutical program. You know, I, I, you know, I, uh, I haven't. I'll have to. Uh, what I'll have to do is look that up after this meeting because the answer is, as I don't know. What, what I'm sure there are task groups that are coming along to to do that on how to set up. And uh, yes, the, I got the slide that was I showed on that. On it was actually from Rachel Bartlett, who's now at MD Anderson. And she would probably, because she, prior to moving to MD Anderson, had to set up a theragnostic clinic at NYU, in, uh, which is a, a New York University mm -hmm. in downtown New York, not far from where Memorial is here. And uh, so uh, uh, she, she, she uh, certainly might have better knowledge on what, uh, what documents and task group reports there are. Uh, and potentially the IAEA is another good resource to look for that kind of information. Um. What is the biological reason for different uptake of PSMA 617 by different tumors in the same patient? Oh, you know, I think it's 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 really genetic heterogeneity. I mean, not all when a tumor cell, when you have a cell, it's not like in a culture dish where 
you know, you grow cells and then they're all the same for a certain for a long period of time and then they might drift. But in a patient, what happens is when cells from the primary prostate metastasize, they go into different sanctuary sites. Some they go into nodes in this you know location, periaortic nodes, and then they go from there to potentially other nodes, and then they go to marrow, uh, and very occasionally they might go to certain other organs. So the microenvironment that is stimulating the growth uh, of those particular metastatic sites are different. And the different environment, microenvironmental pressures lead to either uh, increased expression of PSMA or may decrease or suppress elevated expression of PSMA. And that's true of somatostatin, that's true of, of, uh, of iodine, the ability to produce follicles, or that's true of uh, MIBG, you know, the receptors to which MIBG binds. Uh, I think that's true with any, actually with any antibody peptide or any targeting system. And, and that's why similar to what the practice is in chemotherapy, in chemotherapy, nobody today who has cancer gets one drug, methotrexate. That will not cure anybody. They always have cocktails of three or four agents and then they continually add. But in subsequent therapies, you'll notice they don't go back with the same the same drugs. They can they because the cancer learns to uh, becomes resistant to those particular uh, uh, those particular drugs. Let's see what we get now. All right. The time. All right. Yeah, okay. I know. Uh, in with the interest of time and to respect your time, thank you so much once again uh, for this amazing talk today, and thank you to all the attendees for attending. Um, the The talk will be uh, is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page. Uh, the medical physics for world benefit, and uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for helping moderate this uh, webinar. No, thank you, thank well, you, Arjit, right. and it's uh, unfortunate that we have to wrap up now, but yeah, that's a lead in time. I agree. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hum. This was a very interesting uh, topic. Great presentation. Thanks mm -hmm. to all our participants for all the questions and for the involvement. Uh, I would like also to thank uh, the WAPM headquarters for helping setting up these webinars. Um, we also thank uh, Medical Physics for World Benefit uh, Board uh, members. Uh, please, for previous webinars, and in the future you'll find this one too, you can scan this uh, QR code, or if, if you go to YouTube and just type MPWB, you will find also our channel through there, so you can subscribe to it and uh, turn on your notifications if you would like. I would encourage you all to visit the website of Medical Physics uh, for World Benefits. Stay tuned for future webinars. Thank you again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.